Welcome to Unity 3D by Example, a video instruction course in eight sections. Each section is divided into segments, and each section is roughly 20 minutes long in total. Section 1 will introduce you to how Unity itself works to kind of understand the basic paradigm of Unity. In this section, we're going to take a look at the basic Unity UI paradigm, the basic project structure of a Unity 3D game, game objects and components, which are the basic building blocks of Unity projects, MonoDevelop, which is the integrated development environment or the scripting program that we'll be using. Then, in our final pro tip segment, we'll look at a mono behavior, the basic scripting template of interactive objects in the Unity system. Here we go. If we're going to make games in Unity, we need to know how all of its controls and its basic user interface work. It can be a little bewildering at first, but fortunately, it's pretty easy to understand once you walk through it. When we're done, you'll know the names and locations of every basic element in the Unity 3D UI, as well as what each piece is for. So let's get started. Let's start with the scene view. In Unity, a level is called a scene. Everything the player sees in your game exists in a scene. Even your main menu and stuff like that. But we'll get to that later. Think of the scene view as a 3D representation of everything in your level. You can click on an item and select it. Doing so reveals the handles, which allow you to move the object. For example. As you can see, these handles are for movement. You bring them up by pressing W. You can also bring up Rotation with the E key, or Scale with the R key. You can also move your view of the scene by using the middle mouse button to pan, and the right mouse button to rotate. You can also adjust the camera view with this gizmo here. You'll notice that as I click on the edges of the controls, it moves into preset views such as Perspective, Isometric, looking straight down Y, or X, or Z. On this tab here is the game view. This shows you the view of the game camera, what the player will actually see when they play. And in the case of this scene here, that's this camera right here. Game view can't be manipulated in the same way that a scene view can. It's a window into your running game. But the hierarchy, on the other hand, which is this section here, this is a way to see everything in the scene in a list form. In hierarchy view, things can be nested so that one is a parent of another. This is useful when it comes time to script, but for now just remember that if you see the triangle next to an object's name, it means that it has children object nested in it. Just click the triangle to expand or collapse them. Hierarchy view is useful when it comes time to edit data in an object in your Unity 3D game, like the value of a bonus prize or the amount of damage a gun does, that sort of thing. That's because it works with the inspector panel here. Whenever we have an object selected, this pane will show us its properties, the list of settings we can adjust, and the scripts that are attached to each object. Finally, we have the project view. Where the hierarchy and the scene view show you everything in the currently loaded level, the project view shows you everything in your entire project, the whole game. That's why it's important to keep it organized. Thankfully, just like an object in the hierarchy view, entries in the project view can be nested. This means you can basically create folders to organize everything and make it easier to find. For example, when you create folders in Project View, you're actually creating folders in your computer. When you drag an object into Unity to become an asset for your game, you're actually making a copy of it that gets put into your project structure. And that's about the whole of it. Now, you've walked through the basic UI for Unity 3D. You know where to find objects in your scene and in your project, and you know how to see their properties and select them in the scene view. Believe it or not, that means we're ready to take the first steps towards making your first game. Good luck! We want to get working on our first game, but to do that we need to understand how a Unity project works, and then we can actually make one. Fortunately, Unity 3D makes the last part easy, and so we can actually do this backwards and use that to learn how projects work. The term project is interchangeable with game. For our purposes, a project is a game. And so here at the top of the chart, this is a game. Games are made out of scenes. Scenes are made out of game objects. Game objects are made out of components. Now don't worry if that doesn't make too much sense yet, because we'll explain what each of these are as we go. We just wanted to show you how small components at the bottom 
combined into larger, more complicated objects, which then combine into more complex scenes, which then create an overall game. So let's start by creating our own project. First, we'll need to tell Unity to make a new project space. So to do that, we'll click on the File menu, and then New Project. This will bring up the New Project window. Now you want to give your project a name. Um, let's choose something simple for ours, you know, so that our ambitions aren't too high. How about Meltdown Madness? Now, this list here is a list of packages. In Unity, packages are kind of like add-ons or plugins or pre-built components that you can add to your game. We want to try to do everything from scratch, so the only thing we're going to add here is scripts. And once we've selected the packages we want, we can just hit Create. And since that's not a real project, we'll just hit Don't Say It. And then this will open up a new project space for you. So Unity has actually just created a folder in the location you specified and set up your game project inside that. It also took its basic scripts package and added it to that folder. If later you actually wanted to import any other packages yourself, you could do so from this Assets menu, where you have Import New Asset or Import Package. You can also export your own work as a package to use in future games using this Export Package command. We've taken our first step in building a game, and we understand now that in Unity a project is a game, and so we have a project now that's ready to go. Now you'll be able to begin the work of creating the functional part of the game. Next we're going to see how the elements of a Unity game work by examining game objects and components, the basic building blocks of game interactivity. Good luck! So now you've got a Unity 3D project ready to go, but you'll probably find that it falls a little flat in the game department. Fortunately, we can use Unity itself to add some game to your project. Let's see how. First, we need to understand a little bit about Unity games. Every level in your game is a scene. Even if your game only ever happens on one screen, that screen will be in a scene. And that's what we're looking at here with this blank blue field. This is actually an empty blank scene. It's up to us to add the elements that will make it a game. Elements in your scene are called game objects. In our case, we want to build a game we've called Meltdown Madness, and for that we'll need a reactor core. So let's add a game object to build on. First we'll click on the Create button here in the hierarchy. Then we'll select a cube. We're actually going to change this later, but for now it'll do as a stand-in for our reactor core. Finally, we'll slowly click twice on the cube so we can rename it Reactor Core. What we've done is create a game object. If you click on it in the hierarchy, you can see it has several sections in its inspector view. Each of these sections represents a component. Think of components as the pieces of a game object that tell Unity what it is. This one, for example, is what tells Unity that our reactor core is cube. You can easily add and remove components to change the capabilities of a game object. Let's add an activate trigger to our reactor core. First we'll select the reactor core, then we'll click on the component menu at the top of the screen, then we'll select scripts, and we'll select activate trigger. If you look at the inspector view, you'll see that a new section has appeared for that activate trigger that you just added. It's right here. Removing components is just as easy. First, select the object that has the component you need removed. Then find that component in its inspector view and click on the gear icon here in the corner. Finally, select Remove Component from the drop down menu that appears. And there you have it. We've taken an empty project and we've begun to turn it into a game by adding game objects to a scene and then adding components to those game objects to define how they will behave. We've also learned how to remove components from objects should the need arise. Now you'll be able to build complex game objects out of simpler parts, a key strategy in quickly building games with Unity 3D. Next we're going to jump into scripting and creating our own custom components by looking at MonoDevelop, Unity's integrated development environment. Good luck! Now you've got a game project with a game object in it, but as I'm sure you can see, your game object isn't a functioning element of your game yet. Fortunately, we can use Unity's script editing environment, called MonoDevelop, to change that. But first we'll need to understand MonoDevelop itself. So let's jump into that. Before we actually load up MonoDevelopment, let's talk about scripting. To make your game objects behave the way you want them to, you will have to do some scripting. 
For this course, we'll be using C Sharp, but Unity can actually use JavaScript and Boo as well. We use C Sharp because Unity is based around Mono, which is an open source translation of .NET, something C Sharp is basically perfect for. Don't worry if that doesn't make sense to you yet. While you will need to know how to write code in one of those languages, you don't need to be an expert. Unity does the heavy lifting. You just need to know enough to tell Unity what to lift, if that metaphor makes any sense. That said, if you don't know any C-sharp, or if scripting itself is something new to you, I definitely suggest that you have a look at an entry-level C-sharp tutorial, book, or course. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's have a look at the script editor Unity uses, by default, MonoDevelop. Do you remember when we said that components are what give game objects lives? Well, scripts are how they do it. Every component on your game object is actually a script that you or someone else has written. So, you remember when we added that activate trigger in an earlier segment. Let's put one back again, and we'll do that by going to component, then down to scripts, and then to activate trigger with our reactor core selected. And the reason we did that is so that we can just jump into MonoDevelop by hitting edit script on the reactor core's activate trigger component in the inspector view. Okay, so that's what your activate trigger actually looks like. Don't worry too much about the individual scripts. We'll cover some of that in the next segment. Instead, let's look at MonoDevelop itself. MonoDevelop will automatically color your script as you write it based on the c -sharp language. This is really helpful for spotting typos or things like that. For example, things that you might expect to be blue or pink will instead be black like regular text if you've made some sort of mistake. Also, any blatant Code errors will be outlined with a red squiggly line as if you had misspelled something. One of the things that makes MonoDevelop really useful for working with Unity is its ability to debug in real time. But for that to work, you need to link MonoDevelop to your running copy of Unity. So to do that, first you'll want to click on Run. Then you'll want to click on Attach to Process. This will bring up the Attach to Process window. Select Unity Editor in this window, and then hit Attach. Now that MonoDevelop and Unity are linked, you'll actually be able to see what lines of code are being called as the game runs, and you can do this by setting a breakpoint. And to set a breakpoint, you find the line of code where you want the game to stop, and you click right here, just outside the margin, and it adds this red dot. Now a red dot means that when the game gets to this code, it'll pause the game, bring up MonoDevelop, and show you the state of memory, what variables are set at, things like that, immediately. Unlike, say, Visual Studio, MonoDevelop is the only one that can actually do this with Unity. And alright, that's basically it. We've taken our first look at MonoDevelop by opening MonoDevelop and attaching it to your running Unity instance. Now you'll be able to debug scripts as they're running, quickly finding an error without having to search the entire script. Next we're going to see how we can write our own component scripts to add our unique game elements to the project by using MonoDevelop to build a new Mono behavior. Good luck! Now that you've seen MonoDevelop, and know how to link it to Unity for debugging, you're ready to start scripting. You'll probably find the idea a little daunting, but fortunately Unity and MonoDevelop make this easier than you might think. Let me show you. Our title, Meltdown Madness, is pretty evocative, but it doesn't really tell us what sort of game we're making. Since we want to make something quickly, let's go for something relatively simple. Let's go for the whack-a-mole game model. In our case, our mole will be the control rod of an out-of-control nuclear reactor, and the holes will be one of four reactor cores a control rod could be ejected from. As the manager of the reactor, our player will be responsible for re-engaging the ejected control rod so the reactor doesn't melt down. It really is just a variant of whack-a-mole, but saving a city by keeping a reactor from melting down sounds so much cooler, right? So, we know we're going to need a reactor core, and hey look! You already created a stand-in for one. Why don't we start the process of actually making it behave like one now? First, we'll need to create a reactor core component. To do that, we'll click on the Create button in the Project view, and select c -sharp Script. Now as you can see, it creates something called New Behavior Script, so next we'll rename that to Reactor Core. Everything looks great here, but there is a gotcha. When you rename a script, you can't just rename it in the project view, you also have to rename it inside the script itself. First, double-click on the reactor core script to load it in MonoDevelop. 
Next, we'll look at the class declaration. Now here you can actually see that it's this public class reactor core, because Unity was nice enough to rename it inside the script for us. But it doesn't always do that, so it never hurts to check. And so this is basically a blank mono behavior. It has a start routine, which is called once every time the object is created in your game, and an update routine, which is called once every frame, as long as the object is active. We're not going to add any code right now, so we should just hit save, and then go ahead and close Unity. And that should actually do it. Now all we need to do is assign the script to our Reactor Core game object. So first we grab the Reactor Core script in the project view, and then we drag it to the Reactor Core game object in the hierarchy. You can also use the component menu to add your own scripts the way you added the activate trigger. Your components will be in the script submenu just like the activate trigger was. Components, scripts, Reactor Core. Okay, so there we have it. We've taken a game object with nothing but default components and ended with a Reactor Core game object with a custom built component on it by using MonoDevelop to edit a newly created C Sharp script. Now you'll be able to make your own components and assign them to game objects in the game. Next, we're going to actually flesh out that Reactor Core script and jump into actually writing C Sharp in our Pro Tip section, Understanding a Mono Behavior. Good luck! Welcome to Section 2 of Unity 3D by Example building scenes. In this section of the course, we're going to take a look at creating and loading a scene, the basic level of a game in Unity, building and manipulating game objects, the basic building blocks of a Unity scene, and then we'll talk about using components in game objects, which are the elements that you actually build game objects out of. We'll also talk about building and using prefabs, which are pre-built objects that you make ahead of time. And finally, in the pro tip section, We'll talk about understanding Unity cameras and how you can use them for your game. Here we go. In this section of the course, we're going to dive right into getting chunks of the game done, step by step. What you've learned will make a lot of this easy, but I'm going to call out any problems that might arise as we go. We'll start with setting up a scene to hold our main menu, which we'll actually produce later when we get to UI. Are you ready? First, we'll start by clicking File here at the top, and then we'll select New Scene from the menu. Now at the moment, we have no main menu UI, so let's just save the scene and give it a name. To do that, we'll go back to the file menu, and we'll select Save Scene. Finally, we type in the name Main Menu here in the File Name field, and then we click on Save. Notice how a new object has appeared in the project view? This object represents your level, and can be moved into folders and organized like any other Unity asset. Okay. We know we want the main menu to load first, when our game is run, so let's add it as the first level of the build settings. To do that, we're going to go back to the file menu, and then we're going to click on build settings, which will bring up the build settings page. The build settings page is used for a lot of things. It's basically where you tell Unity what platform you'll be making the game for, what levels are included as part of your build, options for those various platforms, etc. I mentioned earlier that it's where you tell Unity which scenes will actually be included in your final game. Well, one of the scenes we want to include is definitely the main menu. So to do that, we'll hit this Add Current button. And what that does is that adds the currently loaded level into this list of scenes in your build. Do you see that number zero here? That's the scene index. The scene with the lowest index is loaded automatically by Unity when the game is run by our players. That's why we wanted to add the main menu first, in fact. We wanted to make sure it had the lowest scene index. You can actually set them later by dragging and dropping scenes through the list, but this way we always know our main menu is first. And okay, we're done here, so we can just hit the red X to close the screen. Now you know how to make a scene, save it, and add it to the build settings, turning a disconnected scene into an integral piece of your game. Next, we'll build our play space, populating it with the elements we previously created to build the real reactor core space. Good luck! Now that we've learned how to create a scene and add it to the build settings, we're ready to build the main game space. You'll find that the skills you've learned in the last few segments of the course will allow you to build the scene and its component game pieces with relative ease. Let's jump right into it. First, we'll create a new reactor room scene that the game will take place in. To do that, just as a reminder, you go to File, and then New Scene. Now that we're in the new scene, we can begin to build the actual reactor room. If you've opened up the Section 2 version of the project, you will see a folder in the project view called Meltdown Madness Models. 
We've built a few assets we can use to build a reactor room, and we've placed them here for our use. Let's start by building one of the four reactor cores that will form the core of the reactor room. To do that, drag the reactor core model into the hierarchy view, and that's the reactor core floor. Now, we'll add this core's control rod the same way. Drag the reactor rod model into the hierarchy view. The control rod really is a part of the reactor. When we move the reactor, the rod should move with it. In Unity, that means the reactor rod should be a child of the reactor core. To do that, drag the reactor rod in the hierarchy view on top of the reactor core in the same view, just like this. Finally, let's save the scene. Just remember to do that. Go to File, click on Save Scene, and let's name this one Reactor Room. And there you have it. You've started with a blank scene and a few assets and built out your reactor by creating new game objects and childing one game object to another to make a complex object. Next, we'll take the work you did with your reactor core component and put it to work, turning those inert models into the cores of a nuclear reactor. Good luck! After our last segment, we have a reactor room scene with a 3D model of the reactor core laid out and in place. But we don't have any real functionality in there yet. Thankfully, we actually wrote some reactor core behavior in a previous step. You'll find Unity makes bringing the two pieces of work together fairly easy. Let's get started. First, we'll bring the reactor core mono behavior that we wrote earlier into the reactor core game object we created in the last segment. We do that by dragging the Reactor Core script from the project view and dropping it directly onto the Reactor Core game object in the hierarchy. So here's our Reactor Core script, and we'll drag it right there to the Reactor Core. Now that the component has been added, we'll need to set it up. To do that, we have to find its entry in the inspector, here on the right. And so that would be this one right here. To function properly, the component needs a link to the control rod and to up and down position. Do you remember when we added those public variables to our reactor core script? That's what these fields here in the inspector actually are. To fill them, we just need to drag and drop objects, just like when we set up the control rod link. So to do that, we'll grab this, the reactor core, rod rather, and we will drop it right here on the control rod field in the inspector. Next, let's deal with the up and down positions. To do that, we're actually going to need to create a new game object. The easiest way to do that is to hit Control shift n which is a hotkey for New Game Object. Now why don't we rename this to Up Position. And then we can drag it here so that it stays with our reactor. As you can see, a new game object created this way is blank. There's nothing but an address in space called a transform, which is exactly what we need. So next we'll set the transform's position values to 0 for the Up Position object. Scale we want to stay at 1 but let's set the X, Y, and Z here to zero so that it's exactly centered. Next, we'll link the up position object to its field in the reactor core component on the core itself. And just like we did with the control rod, we select the reactor core and then drag the up position to the up position field. Finally, we'll do the same thing for down position. Let's start by duplicating the up position object and renaming it down position. We can just right click, select duplicate, and then rename that to down position. And why don't we move it down the y axis, negative 3. And then finally, just like the rod and the up position, we're going to want to drag it into the down position field here on a reactor core component. So now you've taken your disparate assets, some 3D models you assembled into a reactor core and the reactor core script that controls them, and you've combined them into a functioning reactor core game object. Next, we'll use prefabs to make the job of building a complete level easier by replicating that work to other reactor cores. Good luck! Last time, we set up one of our reactor cores, but we still have three more to set up. Luckily, Unity 3D has a way to make that job easier. Prefabs. We're going to show you how to use prefabs to reap the benefit of your previous work with very little extra effort. Let's get started. Without prefabs, you'd be forced to complete the scene by creating three more reactor cores and going through all of the steps that you went through before. But each reactor core is identical. We'd basically be repeating the exact same steps over and over. Prefabs offer us a way to skip those steps. Prefab is short for Prefabricated Object. 
an object you make in the project itself, and then just copy whenever you need to use one in a scene. First, let's create an empty prefab. To do this, click on Create in the Project view and select Prefab. Let's call this one Reactor Core. Now, do you notice how the created prefab object is this gray square? That means it's empty. There's nothing in it. So we need one last step. So finally, we will fill the prefab with our finished reactor core by dragging it from the scene into the prefab. Notice it turns blue and gains a triangle. Now it's filled with all of the data from our reactor core. The prefab is now exactly the same as the reactor core, which means you can easily propagate the work you did to the rest of the scene. Now we just need to drag the reactor core prefab into the scene, and we have another copy. So then we just take that and position it, and suddenly we have two functioning reactor cores. All we need to do now is repeat the process twice more. One small caveat, though. When you drag a prefab into the scene like that, it's going to place it relatively randomly. You'll notice these decimal values after the X and Ys and Zs, for example. So to make sure everything is lined up, you need to look closely at the reactor cores. Just look for any overlaps or gaps and just eliminate them by careful positioning. So there you have it. You've taken the work you performed in one object, your original reactor core, and you've applied it to several others by making a prefab and then instantiating that prefab multiple times in the scene. Instantiate is really just another way of saying making a copy of something but it's a very powerful tool. Consider a game that uses a monster spawner, for example. Using a mono behavior you write, you could create a monster spawner that spawns monsters every few seconds by instantiating prefabs you link to it. You'll find that even things such as special effects often use prefabs, so expect to see their use more as we move forward. Prefabs are useful for another reason as well. Any change you make to the prefab will propagate out to each of its instances. So if you need to make a change, say to the up position of the reactor core, you're only going to have to make it once on the prefab, and then it will automatically be updated everywhere that prefab is used in the game. Next, we'll take a look at the Unity Camera in the Pro Tips section, Understanding Unity Cameras. Good luck! Now that you've got the reactor course set up, you're probably wondering why they don't seem to show up right in the game view when you hit play. That's because the game view uses a different camera than your scene view. To properly show our cores in game view, we're going to manipulate the scene camera. So let's get started. First, let's make it easier to see the game and scene camera views at the same time. Click on the window menu, then select layouts, and then 2x3. That'll reconfigure the layout here. Here in the large bottom panel is the game's camera view while here in the upper large panel is the scene view. Now why don't we take a look at the camera itself. There's a one-to-one -one correlation between the camera's view frustum, which is what you're seeing here at this gray box, and what you actually see in the game camera. Essentially, the camera can see every object in its frustum, which means they'll be rendered in the game view. If you look at the camera in the inspector, you'll see that there's actually quite a few things you can change. Most important of these for us, though, is field of view. You can change the field of view with this slider here. We're going to try to set it to 45. And if for some reason you can't get it right at 45, which is where you want it, you can just type in 45 into the field and hit Enter. Next, let's set the background color to black. To do that, click on the swatch of blue color here in the inspector, and that'll bring up the color picker. Pick your desired background color, and then just close it. That looks pretty good, but we still need to actually position the camera. So lastly, we'll move to our scene camera view and manipulate the main camera directly. So first of all, just double check that you're in move mode by pressing W. And then you can just start by positioning the camera so that it basically centers your reactors. And then move the camera so it's slightly above them. Then let's go to rotate mode by pressing the E key. Grab this red ring and move it so that it's looking down at the reactors. Of course, now we're exposing their bottom again, so we just repeat the process until they're where we want them to be. Now that the camera is in place, you're ready to go. Congratulations! It may not be a game yet, but you just made your first game objects do what you asked in your first game. Next, we'll go a step deeper and make the cores truly interactive, starting by converting your existing core behavior into a state machine, 
a simple AI system. Good luck! Welcome to Section 3 of Unity 3D by Example, Scripting Interactivity. In this section, we're going to take a look at component basics, what the basic structure is of a component, some useful pre-built components that you can use immediately with very little scripting, how to trap player input to respond to interactivity, We'll also discuss how to communicate between game objects, so for example, how to get your player to communicate with an NPC. And finally, in the Pro Tips segment, we'll discuss building a messaging system, which is a useful way to communicate between objects in the background. Alright, here we go. Our play area is just about ready. Our reactor cores are in place, and they're already moving into the down position at the start of the game. That said, they aren't responding to the player yet. We need to implement the game's interactivity. Thankfully, Unity offers several built-in elements to make this easy. In this segment, we're going to look at the parts of a component script to understand how they work within Unity 3D. Let's get started. First, we'll look at the Reactor Core component that we wrote earlier. To do that, find the Reactor Core script here in the Project View, and then double-click it to open Mono Develop. Do you see this routine here? Update? Just as the comment above it mentions, update is called once per frame. This means that once every game cycle, this object runs the code in update. Update is where you'll put your code that you need to execute all the time, the brain of your object. Since it runs all the time, you actually will want to run as little code as possible here for performance reasons. This is the start routine. The start runs once, when the object is loaded. Generally, start is where you'll put any code you need to run to initialize the object. In our case, we don't need to really initiate anything at this level, so it's blank other than that initial start coroutine move rod line that moves the rods to their down position. There are two other routines that are not included by default that are very useful. Even though we're going to leave them empty, I'm going to add them now so that we can talk about them a bit. These routines are on enable, which is called anytime the object becomes active when it wasn't active originally and on Disable, which is called any time the object is deactivated. So basically, you would put code in these routines to handle pausing and resuming, for example. You can put your pause code in on Disable, and then your resume code in on Enable. When we wrote this component, we wrote it to simply take the reactor control rod and move it to the down position. But in a real game, the control rod is going to have to move when the game needs it to, not all the time. To solve that problem, we're going to make our reactor core a state machine, which is just a fancy way of saying we're going to make the reactor core aware of what condition it is in and then tell it how to deal with each condition it could possibly be in. First, we'll add the enumeration of potential states here at the top. And again, I'm going to paste the code in here to be quick. This doesn't actually let you set the reactor core state, so next we'll have to add a variable that uses this enumeration. We're also going to add some variables for venting time, the time each rod stays in the up position. Next, we're going to replace our move rod routine with a process core state routine. This will use a switch statement to react differently to each of the different states that we've outlined. And finally, we're going to remove the reference to move rod in the start routine and we're going to add a reference to process core state in the update routine. This code is all available in the course materials as well. If you open the section 3 version of the Meltdown Madness project, you'll see that the reactor core code there has already been modified. Okay, so we've taken our reactor core component and dissected it, learning about the start, update, on enable, and on disable routines in the process. Then we took that knowledge and turned our reactor core into a finite state machine, a basic form of game AI. Next, we'll take a look at some of Unity's built-in components and the Unity Asset Store to learn about adding useful pre-built components to our game. Good luck! Now that we've converted our reactor core into a state machine, we can turn to the task of making it respond to the player's action. But you'll find that to do that, we're going to need to implement some relatively complicated pieces of functionality. Thankfully, Unity 3D isn't just a game engine. It's also the core of a vibrant development community, full of developers willing to share their own solutions to the problems we all face. 
In this section, we'll look at some of Unity's included components and the Asset Store to find pre-built solutions to our problems, saving us a ton of time and effort. Let's get to it. Our first problem is that we have no way to detect if anything has been clicked. We have no way to tell our reactor core to change state, essentially. To address that, we'll need to add a mesh collider component to our reactor core prefab. A mesh collider is a component that allows a 3D model to detect mouse presses or when another game model comes in contact with it, or collides with it. First, select the reactor core component prefab and then click on the component menu. Finally, select Mesh Collider from the Physics submenu. With the Mesh Collider in place, we'll be able to make our reactor's trap player input and respawn, but we'll get to that in a later section. You can also look into using a box or a capsule collider instead of the Mesh Collider, where a Mesh Collider gives you a perfect fit, that is, where it ensures you can only click or collide with what you actually see from the game model, it comes at a high performance cost. A capsule or a box collider might do the job just as well and bring with it a savings in performance. Yes, you might technically be able to click on an empty space right next to the model and have it register a hit, but the difference in performance is totally worth it in most cases. That said, Unity's physics engine is actually pretty robust, and so for what we're doing, using a mesh collider isn't really going to be a problem. In fact, when you get ready to work on more complex games, come back to the components menu and have a look at the stuff that's in there. A lot of what I used to consider hard is now mostly done for you with all of these pre-built components. But before you go off and poke around, I'd like to introduce you to the Asset Store. So first click on the Window menu, and then select Asset Store. Just as you've written a custom component for your game, many other developers using Unity have written their own routines, composed their own music, or modeled their own 3D assets. The Asset Store is a place where these developers have put their work up for sale. Don't worry, we won't be requiring anything from the Asset Store for this course but it is worth looking at. There are easier ways to do just about everything we're going to be showing you from here on out, and most of them are available here for very little money. In fact, if you notice this bar on the right here, you can go down to Top Free, and you can see a list of the most popular free assets that are available in the store. And as you can see, sometimes they're scripts like controllers. This is for allowing you to control a character in an MMO. Sometimes they're assets, like the models needed to build a 3D village. And, you know, sometimes they're even whole games, like this complete project tutorial for building a car game. Basically, if you ever get stuck, have a look around the Asset Store to see if there's a solution available. If you can't find one in the Asset Store, that's when it's time to hit Google. Alright, we've taken a look at Unity's built-in components, and we've used it to add a mesh collider to our reactor core prefab, which in turn automatically added it to all of our reactor cores in our scene. Then we went one further and we took a look at the Asset Store, a community market of pre-built assets, components, and audio offered for sale by fellow developers. Now when you're stuck, you'll have a place to look for potential solutions, many of which are free and most of which are incredibly inexpensive. Next, we'll use the functionality added by the Mesh Collider to trap player input and make our game start to play like a real game. Good luck! Now that we've added a mesh collider to our reactor core, we're ready to make these cores respond to the player's touch, or click in our case. To do that, we'll have to figure out some way to detect what the player clicks on. We'll need to find a way to trap our player's input. Thankfully, Unity provides a very easy way to do that via the mesh collider. Let me show you how. The mesh collider is meant to work in conjunction with your own components. While it does have some options that you can manipulate, they're mainly for its use in games that use full-blown physics simulations. Since we're only using the physics simulation to detect player input, we can ignore these options and we can go straight to our own code in the reactor core component. First, double click on the reactor core component in the project view to open it in MonoDevelop. Since we've added that mesh collider, we can access new events similar to on enable or on disable, although in this case they're going to be specific to player input, on mouse down and on mouse up. So for us next, we're going to add an on mouse up routine after the on update routine in our reactor core. Next, we'll add a switch to this routine that checks the reactor core state and sets it to moving down if the control rod is currently in the up position. And again, I'm going to paste in the code for speed. Okay, well, you know, honestly, that's it. There we have it. If we hit play in Unity, we should see the control rods move down only after we click on each reactor core. So let's give it a shot.
Very nice. So what we've done is we've taken code in our custom component that had no access to the player's input. And with help from the Mesh Collider, we've added the ability to detect when the player clicks on our game object. Now our game is truly interactive. Next, we'll turn our interactive objects into a real game by creating an overseer object and building a way for it to communicate with and control all of our reactor cores so that it can enforce our game rules and keep score. Good luck! The game is finally starting to take shape, thanks to the addition of some basic interactivity. But at this point it isn't really fun. That's because there's no real way to win or lose yet. In fact, there are no game rules at all. We're going to need to find a way for our four reactor cores to work together and to enforce some game rules to make the game fun. So to accomplish this, we're going to create an overseer object. A sort of manager object that will keep track of the clock, keep the player's score, detect wins or losses, and tell the reactor cores when they should move. Using an overseer class like this is one approach. You could also try to handle all of your high-level control within each reactor core so that they coordinate their own actions. But that's prone to all kinds of unforeseen interactions what we call edge cases. Take keeping score, for example. We want to score a point whenever a player clicks on a reactor core, but without an overseer to keep the score, we'd have to have the reactor cores talk amongst themselves and somehow determine what the final and valid score should be. That sort of work is possible, but when the task at hand is a known problem, that is, when you understand the constraints you're working within, there's really no point to that sort of extra complexity. Think of our overseer as a store manager that makes sure the employees stay on task. Building something like that might sound daunting, but Unity makes this pretty easy too. Let's get started, shall we? First, let's start by creating a new game object and naming it Overseer. Next, let's child our reactor cores to the Overseer object by dragging them into it. Now, we'll create a new C-sharp script in the project and name it Overseer. Finally, we'll drag the Overseer script onto the Overseer object to add the component to the game object. Now that the Overseer object is roughly set up in Unity, we need to write code that will manage the four reactors. So we'll first open it in MonoDevelop. Then we're going to add a line telling Unity that we want to use the systems.collections.generic library here at the top of the file. Next, we'll add a public list variable to hold our reactor cores. We'll call it reactor cores. I'm also going to add a boolean called managing, which we can use just to keep track of what the overseer is doing. Now we're going to add a method to randomly select from one of the reactor cores in the list, basically a selection algorithm. And I'm going to paste that into the end of the file here. Finally, we'll use the overseer start method to put all four cores in the down position. And we'll do that by adding a quick clause into the start routine, just like so. Okay. Now we want the overseer to pick a core randomly and raise it now that they're all down. So to do that, first we're going to create a new coroutine called manage reactors. And we'll do that by adding the following method to the end of the file. Coroutine is a type of method that can sort of run itself in the background. It's not exactly accurate. What it really does is it can run a piece of itself and then tell Unity to go off and do other things for a while before coming back and finishing up. In our case, we tell Unity to let the coroutine pause for between 1.6 and 2.3 seconds, which is this line here, while Unity goes off and does other work. And then when it comes back, it'll actually select a random core and raise it. Finally, now that the coroutine is in, we can call it from the update routine by adding some more code. And this is actually where that managing boolean that I mentioned earlier comes in. So we'll check, and if we're not managing, that is, if managing is set to false, then we will start the coroutine, manage reactors. Okay, now all that's left to do is to go back to Unity. We're going to finish wiring up our overseer. You'll notice there is this new reactor cores entry in the component with a size of zero. This is a list, but it's empty right now, so let's fill it with our reactor cores. There's easy ways to do this in hard ways. Let's go with the easy way. See this lock up here? When you press this, it freezes the inspector into this view, which means that we can now go collect our reactor cores here and just drag them right into the list. Just like that. Now all we have to do is save, 
And when we hit play, we should see that we have a basic whack-a-mole game loop. Not bad, right? We've taken your animating reactor cores, and we've connected them to the Overseer, a component we wrote to manage the overall game. By doing so, we've made a completely functional whack-a-mole game loop. Next, we'll discuss more advanced ways to communicate between objects in our Pro Tips section, specifically messaging systems. Good luck! Welcome back! This segment will deviate slightly from our normal format. I apologize for that. In our last segment, we built our Overseer class and tightly bound our reactor cores to it by building a list of reactor cores in our component and populating it with the physical cores from the game level. This is a perfectly acceptable solution for us, since our game is relatively simple. It's even scalable. You can have as many or as few reactor cores in your final game as you want. All you have to do is put another reactor core into the scene and add it to the list in the Overseer, or to remove one, you just reduce the size of the list. That said, it's not an approach that will work for every game, or even every situation in a single game. There will be times when you won't know exactly what objects will be in a scene, for example. Consider a game with a monster spawner. Until those monsters are spawned, there's no way of knowing where they will be, who they will be, or even what weapons they'll use. Speaking of weapons, the bullets of a gun are another potential example. When you find yourself in this situation, I strongly suggest that you look into C Sharp Messenger for ideas on how to build a messenger system. In a nutshell, a messenger system allows an object to broadcast a message to the scene at large, leaving it to other game objects to listen for that broadcast and react to it. So imagine, for example, that you want to make a game where planes are landing at an airport. You might create a control tower object that listens for planes to broadcast a landing request then assigns the plane a slot in its landing pattern to allow it to land. Or if you want to consider the diagram, imagine a game where it could end at any moment and the individual objects don't know when the game is going to end. So what they do is they wait instead for some overseer to broadcast a game over message, at which point, if they hear it, they can then react and run whatever game over code they need to run. A messenger system is definitely overboard for meltdown madness, but if you're looking for a fun evening challenge, head over to http www.unifycommunity.com slash wiki slash index.php question mark title equals C sharp messenger and see if you can implement a messenger system and then try to use it in your overseer instead of the direct list of reactor cores. There is a built-in messaging system in Unity as well. It's a bit constrained, which is why I recommend using your own solution. But the next time you're looking at the Unity script reference, you might want to look up Send Message, Send Message Upwards, and Broadcast Message. They'll get the job done, and that could save you the trouble of having to write a better system on your own. But, for what it's worth, we won't need any sort of messaging system for our game. So thanks for listening. That's all we really wanted to say. You'll find that a fully functional messenger system or an equivalent can be a very powerful tool in future game development. In our next section, we'll take a look at audio in the Unity engine as we start the task of implementing music and sound effects in Meltdown Madness. Good luck! Welcome to Section 4 of Unity 3D by Example, Sound and Music. In this section, we're going to take a look at Unity Audio Basics, Building and Playing Game Music, Controlling 3D Audio Sources, Setting Volume and Controlling Music Playback, and finally, in our Pro Tips section, we'll look at saving player preferences. Here we go! Our reactor cores are now behaving appropriately, but we still have no audio. We're halfway towards a finished game right now. You'll find that a game won't really feel complete until you have both sound and music. Fortunately, we can use Unity's built-in audio engine to easily implement both sound effects and music tracks. Let's see how it's done. First. We need to understand how Unity Audio works, so let's start by going over the various parts of the Unity Audio system. Unity uses a listener and source paradigm. That is to say, for a sound to be heard by your player, it has to be in range of a listener. An audio listener is like a microphone or your player's ears. By default, there is an audio listener component attached to the main camera, here. There can only be one audio listener in the scene. So unless you want something other than the camera to act as the player's ears, you should be good to go with the current arrangement. 
If you do find a reason to move the listener, remember to remove the listener from the audio camera, or your game won't be able to run properly. Unity will stop your game with an error. As you can see, the audio listener is a pretty simple component. There's literally nothing to edit. Basically, as long as you have one, and only one in the scene, any sound it can hear will be played by the game for the player. But first, we'll need some sounds to play. So why don't we start by creating an audio assets folder. And then let's open that audio assets folder in the Explorer view. And I'm going to drag in two audio clips here. One is the audio clip for sound effect in the game, and the other is a music track. Both of these are AUG Vorbis files. Actually, Unity offers pretty good support for popular audio formats of all kinds. Now when I return to Unity, you'll see that they're right here. So what it was doing while we were waiting was actually checking to see if it had to convert file formats based on your publishing platform. For example, if you had decided to publish the game to Android, it would have converted these AUG Vorbis files into MP3 files to save space. In most cases, no conversion will be necessary, mobile platforms like I mentioned being the big exception. Okay, now that we've got some files to play, we're going to need a way to play them. That's where an audio source comes in. We know we want to make a sound when a player clicks a spot, hit or miss. So let's set up an audio source in the Reactor Core prefab. Now you'll notice, I went over here and not to the prefab. That was just to make a point. Right, You really want to make your changes to the prefab so they propagate out to the game without you having to make the changes again yourself. So first what we're going to do is we need to add the audio source component to the prefab. Do that by going to component, audio, audio source. Then we need to assign the audio clip to its audio clip field, and that's the button clip. So we just drag it right here into the audio clip field. And then last, we want to uncheck play on awake so that the sound doesn't play every time the reactor comes online. And also you'll want to double check that loop is unchecked. If you wanted it to repeat after it was done playing, you would check loop, but otherwise leave it unchecked so it plays as a one shot, that is to say it plays one time. There's a lot more you can do with an audio source. For example, you can set pan, or you can even set volume fall off, which is the distance it can be heard from. For the moment, though, we really don't need to worry about any of this. We're really close to the camera anyway, so all of our sounds are going to be heard, and there's really no reason to mess with stuff that isn't broken yet. In fact, I'm pretty sure we're done. We've taken raw audio assets and ended with an in-game object ready to play a converted audio clip by importing the asset, creating an audio source, and assigning the converted audio clip to the newly created audio source. Next, we'll set up background music as we go over building and playing game music. Good luck! Okay, so we've put in basic sound sources and we've supplied the clip for them to play, but we haven't actually set up a music playback system yet. That's not as complicated as it sounds. In fact, it's a lot like setting up your sound effects, as you'll soon see. Are you ready to get started? We'll need a music clip, of course. We want a piece of looping music we can play continuously in the background. In our case, we imported a 10 second music loop donated to the course by industry audio designer and composer Stephen Paps of Skyward Corp in a previous segment. So that's the audio clip we're going to use. So to implement this audio, first we're going to have to select the asset in the project view. And then we're going to want to uncheck 3D sound since this is going to be background music, not something you hear environmentally. Then you're going to want to hit apply. Next, we're going to want to create a blank game object using the Control shift n hotkey. And we're going to call this Music Player. Now we want to add an audio source to our Music Player. And again, that's Component Menu, Audio, Audio Source. Next, we're going to drag our Music Clip into the Audio Clip field of our Music Player. And finally, we're going to check the Loop box. In a previous segment, I had mentioned that you want to keep that unchecked for one-shot audio, but for music that's going to loop repeatedly, you definitely want to keep that checked. And last but not least, we will hit Save. So there you go. We've taken our imported music file, and we've built a music playback system. It really is that simple. Now, if we hit Play, we should hear background music playing. Just like that.
Next, we'll look at how to get our sound effects objects to play on command in our Controlling Audio Sources segment. Good luck! So now that you've got an audio source ready to play, you're probably wondering how to tell that audio source when it's time to play that sound file. Fortunately, we can use the reactor core mono behavior that we wrote earlier to control the core's audio source. Let's see how. We'll start by opening up the reactor core in mono develop. First, we need to modify the reactor core so that it is aware of the sound attached to it. To do that, we'll add a public audio source variable to the reactor core script right up here at the top. Like so. Finally, we'll need to modify the reactor core so that it knows to play a sound when it's selected. To do that, we'll add some code to the onMouse up routine that creates a reference to the audio source in our reactor core. We'll just do that right here at the top of onMouse up. Okay, so what this bit of code does is it calls our select sound audio source, if it's been properly linked, and tells it to play the audio clip. In this case, it'll play the sound only one time, since we used the play one shot method. You can also add a specific volume level when you call the play one shot method, by adding it as an argument at the end as a float value between 0 and 1, so for example, 0.5f would be half volume. Finally, last but not least, we need to set up the link between the audio source and the script we just wrote. So to do that, we'll first save the script, then return to Unity, and select the reactor core prefab. Then we want to drag the audio source from within the reactor core prefab in the inspector view up to the select sound field here in the reactor cores component in the very same inspector view. All right, so there you have it. We've taken the audio source we set up earlier, and we've integrated it into our reactor core object by referencing the object in our code. Now, when a player clicks on a reactor core, it will play our select sound, so the player will know the game recognized the action. Next, we'll focus on controlling the volume of music and sound effects so that you can better hear that sound. Good luck! Now our game is really starting to come alive. In fact, with the sound that we just added, it might even be too noisy for some players. That means we should add some sort of volume control to the game. In fact, we should let players turn the music off and on too, don't you think? At least Unity makes this an easy task. Here, let me show you how it's done. Let's open our Overseer script in MonoDevelop. Of course, we do this by double-clicking on the Overseer script in the project view. So let's focus on volume initially. We'll let the player use the plus and minus keys to turn volume up and down. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a volume control method to our Overseer. And I'm just going to paste in the code. We're going to want to add that right here, right at the top. So this method will increase or decrease the volume by 5% when we call it. But now we need to set up a way for players to actually use it. So next we'll add a routine that checks to see if the player is pressing the plus or minus buttons. And again, this is going to be a routine where I just paste the code in. And just a reminder, all of the code is available for review in the course material. So if by pasting in the code you feel like you missed something, please go back and read. Finally, we'll modify our update method to call the process key input method that we just wrote. So we just go to the update routine, and we will add, just like that. So that will take care of volume control. So let's now focus on music playback. To do that, let's add a button to stop and restart the music. First, we'll have to add a reference to the music player. So back at the top of the class, we'll add a public audio source variable called music player. Next, we'll write a method to stop and restart the music. And we're going to put that right here after process cube. And again, I'm just going to paste coding. Next, we'll add a check in our process key input method that calls the music manager when the spacebar is pressed. Just add a new if clause right at the end. Okay, so now all we have to do is save and then go back to Unity for the final step.
Now all we have to do is we need to set up Unity's Music Player Reference by dragging the Music Player into the Music Player field in the Overseer's Inspector view. And that's that. Now, when you hit play, the game will play music that you can start and stop with the spacebar. Or if you prefer, you can just turn the volume down with minus and plus. See, that's volume up and down. Turns our music off. Next, we'll look at saving the current volume level in music playback state so the players won't have to keep resetting things when they play. We'll do that in our Pro Tips segment. Good luck! Now that our players can set volume level and turn the music on and off, we suddenly find ourselves with things the players will want to remain the same between gaming sessions. That means we're going to need a way to save the player's settings and then load them back in again the next time they play. Normally, this is the part where I'd say Unity makes it easy, but in actuality, it'll be .NET that makes this one easy. To be fair though, that's primarily because we're going to skip Unity's method of doing this in order to illustrate some basic file manipulation. However, Unity's Player Preferences class, or Player Prefs, can handle everything we're using our own custom class here for in this segment. Look it up! For saving simple data like option settings, the Player Prefs class is definitely worth investigating. But the method we're going to use can work for nearly any scenario, be it something simple like options or full-blown complex save games and database data with varied data types and complex data structures. Let's get started, shall we? We'll start by creating a new Preferences class. To do that, we'll create a new C-sharp script in the Project View and name it Preferences. Then we'll open it up in Monodebellum. And we're going to replace all of this text with new text that I'm about to paste in. So you may have noticed we're using some new libraries at the top. This will add some overhead to the game. It might get a little tiny bit bigger, but it's definitely worth it for the functionality that we'll get. So now that we have this class, we're going to add some save and load routines to it by adding the following code. I'll just paste it in right here. Okay, at this point, our preferences are ready to be saved and loaded. That's what these two routines do. One saves, one loads. But we still have to integrate our preferences into the Overseer. So we're going to switch over to the Overseer in Monodevelop. I'm going to first save this file. And I'm going to move over to the Overseer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the start routine so that it loads the player preferences if they exist. And I'm just going to paste this code in. Okay. Next we'll need to add a time passed variable to the Overseer class. We'll add that up here at the top. And finally, we're going to add some code to the process key input method that saves the preferences every 10 seconds or so. And I'm going to add that code right here to the end of the process key input method. Now, once we save the class, our player's volume and music playing preferences will be saved every 10 seconds of gameplay. That's a little inelegant, but we haven't set up any UI yet, so that's the easiest way to deal with it. Speaking of UI, in the next section of the course, we'll be looking at Unity's built-in GUI system, starting with a look at the basics. Good luck! Welcome to Section 5 of Unity 3D by Example. The topic of this section is the GUI, or the Graphical User Interface. In this section, we're going to take a look at the very basics of Unity's GUI system, the coding behind it and how it works, we're also going to look at how to skin your Unity GUI so that it looks precisely the way you want it to. Also, we'll look at using game experience itself as GUI, maybe skipping your typical heads-up display for something like lights that change color in the scene to paint the right kind of mood. We'll also look at really basic stuff like score and time displays so the players will know how they're doing and when their round is going to end. And then finally, we'll show you how to pause and end a game round in the game using the GUI system. Here we go! We've finally got the pieces of our game together, but we're not really communicating score, or even showing the player how to actually play the game yet. That's where a graphical user interface comes in, or a GUI. Things like a score display, a timer, or even a pop-up how to play message are all part of the GUI, the GUI. Unity has a built-in GUI framework that you can use to create these elements. Starting at the basic level, with the GUI class and GUI styles, you can build just about any sort of UI you need. Let me show you how. 
Right now, we've got our four reactors, and they'll each spit out their control rod when they go critical. To put a control rod back in place, the player is supposed to click on it, but there's nothing to show the player that's how it works. So let's start by making an info box that says, click a control rod to re-engage the reactor. To do that, we'll first open the Overseer script and move down to the end of the update method. Now, we're going to add a new method called onGUI. onGUI is a special method that is called once per GUI event, in the same way that update is called once per frame. However, because it is event-based, it may actually run several times a frame, so keep that in mind. Finally, in the onGUI method, we're going to add a line of code that will put up a small text box with some instructions, like so. We're using a method here called GUI.box, which isn't actually the method you would normally use to display text. It's really used to set up backgrounds or frames, like maybe the background of a button or the border around a menu. We're exploiting its ability to display simple text here so that we get a background behind our text to make it easier to read in front of the reactors. Normally, you'd use GUI.label to display text. As a point of personal style, I tend to use GUI.box that way often, but don't take that to mean it's a standard. Now if we save, and go back to Unity and hit play, we should see our instructions at the edge of the reactor room, right there. On GUI and the GUI class can be used together to create boxes like that. They can also be used to create text labels, buttons, checkboxes, basically any UI element you can think of. Check out the Unity scripting reference for more examples. But for now though, let's make each of the reactors print a line of warning text whenever they're going critical. We'll build a simple reactor status panel, basically. So to do that, let's go back to the on GUI routine. First, we'll set up a group for the reactor display, and then we'll set up GUI boxes that change their display based on the status of each reactor. This is actually going to be quite a bit of code, so I encourage you to go review it in the course materials. A group is like a shell, sort of like a wrapper. Anything between the begin group and end group calls can be moved together by moving the group around instead of the individual elements. Think of a group as one giant UI element that is filled with other UI elements. So now, all we have to do is hit save, and then there you have it. The player now knows how to play the game, and they know the status of each reactor thanks to our using the onGUI event method in our script in conjunction with the GUI class's box and group methods. Now, of course, it's not particularly reactor themed, so next we'll look at building a GUI skin to make the UI look like something you'd see in a rusting old reactor. Good luck! Now the player knows how to prevent a meltdown and how to interact with our reactors, but the GUI we have looks very plain and not at all immersive. We're going to fix that by creating a GUI skin a sort of template for our UI that tells Unity how to draw the GUI using our own textures and color schemes. Why don't we get started? We'll start with setting up a new GUI skin object. First, select Create from the Project view, and select GUI skin from the menu. Let's call it Reactor Room Skin for now. A GUI skin is a lot like a cascading style sheet. It basically contains a collection of settings like font size, font choice, and the like for Unity to use in specific circumstances. You can, for example, override the default box settings to give the boxes a custom background. The real power of a GUI skin, though, comes with the ability to add your own custom GUI styles. Let's define a GUI style for our reactor display boxes. First, in the GUI skin, go down to the Custom Styles line and expand it. Next, let's go to the first element in it and expand it and rename it to Reactor Console. Then we'll expand its normal section and drag our reactor console texture into the background field. Now, you may be wondering where that reactor control panel texture is. You'll find it in the Meltdown Madness Models folder here in the project view. I added it between courses. Okay, and to do that, we're going to lock our inspector view by clicking the lock here. We're going to go to the GUI textures folder here in Meltdown Madness Models. First, we'll expand normal. Then we'll drag the reactor console into the background field. Now I'm using a texture I made with a paint program. 
this texture will be in the Section 5 version of the project for you to look at, of course. Okay, next we'll change the style text color to a dark green. To do that, we'll come down to text color. We'll change the color to green. And finally, we'll center the text, make it bold, and change the font size so that it looks nice. So first we'll change alignment to upper center. Then we'll set the font size to 16. Then we'll change the font style to bold. Finally, we're going to change the Y offset here to plus 5, uh, positive 5. It's just to make sure that it's centered right. Okay, now that we've created a GUI skin and we've defined a style in it, we need to make our code aware of that. So let's go to the Overseer script. First, let's add a reference variable for our GUI skin at the top of the Overseer class. We'll add it right here in this blank line, like so. Then, in our on GUI method, let's set up some code to draw our reactor status boxes using the new reactor console style we created. And so what we're going to do is we're going to modify these lines here to check to see if we have a GUI skin. And if we do, to use the reactor console style that we define. Otherwise, we'll have it use the regular style. And now I'm going to do this really quick to all of them. Normally I'd paste this in, but I figured that if we did it on the fly here, you could see just some of the shortcuts you can take, you know, copy and paste. And this will be the last one. What we're doing here is we're checking to see if our GUI skin is set up. And if it is, we're sending along the name of the style we want our box to use as the final argument of the GUI.box method. But we also had a fallback in case our skin isn't set up where we use the default box style. That's the point of the else section of every if clause here. At this point, we'll have borders around our status display, but that'll just display text with a border behind it. It's really not, you know, a console yet. To fix that, let's make five different GUI styles one for each of the possible reactor states, and alternate between them based on the current state of each reactor. So first, let's save, and then let's go back into Unity. Now let's go to the custom style section of our GUI skin. And let's change the size of the list of custom styles here from 1 to 2. Now if you collapse the original reactor console, you'll notice there are two of them now. Whenever you increase the size of an array of a list here, It'll always make a copy of the last entry. So now I'm going to modify this so that it becomes a status indicator for the normal state of the reactor, the nominal state. And so I'm going to start by changing the name of this copy. Now let's go to the normal section here. And let's change the background texture by dragging in our reactor status nominal texture. And then let's change the text color to a dark gray so it'll be easier to see against the uh, texture that we just chose. Finally, we'll change the font size to 12 and turn off bold down in the font section. And that gets us one of the five new states. So now, to make the rest of them, we'll simply increase the size to 6. And then because it made copies of the last entry, all we really need to do now is change the names here. And in the normal section, change the texture. And last but not least. So now that we've actually set up the styles, we'll need to change the code in the overseers on GUI method to implement these new styles just like we did with the status console. So we'll go back to Mono Develop, and here in each of these switch statements, we'll add some code that will alternate between the styles. So we'll start by adding a new variable, which we'll call myStyle here at the top of the on GUI method. Then we're going to go through each element of the switch statements here, and we're going to add a line that sets that my style string equal to one of the styles that we just created, like so. And we'll do this for each of the states.
And then the next step, now that we've actually defined which style we're going to use based on state, is to set up the GUI box to use that style. So just like before, we'll check if we have our skin set up. And if we do, we'll draw our GUI box with our special style. But if we don't, we'll use the default GUI box style. Now I'm going to rapidly go through and do the same for the remaining three cores. It's literally the exact same code. The only difference is the rectangles where the boxes are drawn is different. All right, here I go. And to spare you the terrible boredom of watching all of it, we're going to use the magic of a crossfade to crossfade to us being finished. And that should just about wrap it up. There's actually one last piece of code that we're missing here. Uh, I'm going to put it up here in this blank line. And what it is, it's a piece of code that checks to see if we have a skin. When we tell the game, that's the skin we want to use. If we don't do this, it'll actually never use our game skin no matter what we do. Okay, now as we head back into Unity, we should see instant results. As you can see, GUI skins are very simple to set up, but they have dramatic results in game. Uh, and they're also very easy to change. You can see this gray font color that we used just really isn't working with the artwork. So to fix that, we can go right into the GUI skin, go to each status, and let's set it to a black. Let's try that. Again, you'll see I just manually changed all six styles in a matter of seconds. Unity is a very easy to use system once you understand it. Now let's see what effect that had. Ah, uh, that's much better. So there you go. Next, we'll take a look at linking events in your GUI with your in-game assets to create a more immersive UI experience. Good luck. Now we have a pretty slick status display, and we even have a reminder of how to play the game. We've made some pretty big strides on our way to finishing this thing up. But those reactor cores are a little flat, aren't they? You may have noticed that between sections of the course, I added some lighting into the reactor cores to try to make them look a little more interesting. Maybe that's not enough. Now that we have some UI to show the player what each reactor is doing, why don't we integrate similar feedback into the world itself, using that light? If we can make the game experience itself function as UI, we can alleviate the need for the player to move his eyes away from the action to read the UI display. That said, with our nice UI up there for when the player does want to take a look, the two methods together will make a more immersive game experience. In our case, we're going to make the reactor change its spotlight color whenever it changes state, so that the status lights in the GUI and the lights from the reactor are the same. Let's get started. First, we'll need to add a reference to the light and the colors we want to use into the reactor core script. So we'll need to open the reactor core. And so we're going to add those references by adding a light variable called core glow. And then we're also going to add five color variables, one for each possible reactor state. Next, we'll go to the process core state routine and find the switch statement inside. Then we'll add some code to each case that changes the color by using a color alert. What this does is tell Unity to change the color from its current value to a color along the way towards its destination color, based on the amount of time that has passed since the last frame. So now I'm going to add a similar line for each of these states. Okay. Basically, when you lerp something, you provide the starting value, in our case the starting color, the target value, in our case the color we want to change to, and a value between 0 and 1 that represents how far towards that target color you are. Think of it as the percentage of the target color that you've already moved towards. In our case, we use time.delta time, 
which is a value supplied through Unity's time class that represents how much time has passed since the last frame was processed. Since our current color changes with each call of the lerp, we move along the line towards the other color at a relatively fixed rate. That's basically because time.delta change is relatively stable. That's mainly because we are not a processor intensive game. Finally, we'll save and head back to Unity to wire up these variables to the real light and watch it work. So we'll save, head on back to Unity, and then let's look at the reactor core prefab. And you'll see we have some new fields. So first things first, let's move in the core glow, which is our spotlight. And we just grabbed our spotlight from the prefab, drug it right into the core glow field in our reactor core prefab. Next, we should change the colors which we can do by clicking here and then trying to match them against the textures. One trick that often works is to go like so and use the eyedropper, which you can do in two ways. You can either bring up pop-up, which gives you more detail, or you can use just the eyedropper here. which is almost automatic. Now one problem with trying to match the texture directly is that lights apply their colors slightly differently, and so you might need to use brighter values to get the kind of result that you want. So what I'm doing here is just sort of brightening these up a little bit, really quick. in the hopes that I'll bring out more of the original intent with these colors. In fact, in this case, I think I'm going to make it more red, too. Like so. All right, let's see how we did. Let me save real quick. And there you go. Now as the core moves through its states, the glow from deep in the reactor changes color accordingly. Now the game isn't so flat and static. Next, we'll build a score and timer display so players can actually see if they're winning or losing the game. Good luck! Welcome to Section 6 of Unity 3D by Example. Title Screens and Menus. In this section, we're going to be taking a look at building a title screen, building the main menu so that players can load your game and then select to play, and then finally in our pro tip section, we'll talk about how you can create a pause menu by reusing the work you've already done to build your main menu. Here we go! In this segment of the course, we're going to learn about building a title page, basically the logo splash screen that introduces your game to the players before the actual menu or the game itself is loaded. Right now, we have the back half of the game loop, the actual play area, basically done. What we're missing is the front end, just like I said, not just the splash screen, but also the main menu. Thankfully, we actually already know how to fix the problem with the splash screen, even if that's not obvious. Let's start at the top with the title page. Are you ready to get started? First, we'll need to open the main menu scene we made back when we were learning about the Unity basics. Just a quick reminder. Unity scenes have the Unity White Cube logo next to their names in the hierarchy. Next, we'll want to add a game object into the scene. It can actually go anywhere, and we want to call it Front End Manager. Then, we'll want to make a corresponding C Sharp script in the project view, also called Front End Manager. Now, let's open that script and set up a reference to the GUI skin we made earlier, as well as a pair of booleans, one called Show Menu that we'll use to control the main menu later, and another called Waiting that we'll use to control when our logo page goes away. Next, we're going to add an IE numerator called Menu Delay that will control when we change the state of the two booleans we just added. Finally, we're going to add the onGUI method and write some code that will display a logo screen that covers the entire screen width. Now that the code is set up, it's time to wire it all up in Unity. So we'll save this file and close MonoDevelop. And then all that remains is to add the component to our game object, set up the new splash page style on the GUI skin, and then link the GUI skin to our front end manager. 
We'll start by dragging our front-end manager script to our front-end manager game object so that it becomes the behavior used by the object. Then we'll select the front-end manager game object and drag the reactor room GUI skin into its My Skin field. Now we need to set up the splash page style in the GUI skin itself. First, we'll add a seventh custom style to the GUI skin and name it Submit Splash Page. So we do that by changing size to 7, changing this, changing its name to Splash Page. Now we need to add a Splash Page image into the project. I'm going to drag in the logo for my Indie Game Studio, but any 1024 by 768 image should do, so by all means replace it with your own. Next, drag that file into the background field of the normal section in your new custom style. So here's your new custom style. Here's normal. We're going to take this banner here and we're going to drag it like that. And there you have it. Next, we'll segue from the splash screen to the main menu and we'll learn about interactive GUI elements like buttons. Good luck! Now, we're showing a logo splash page, but we don't actually have the main menu ready to go. Thankfully, Unity's GUI system makes putting an attractive main menu together as simple as writing a few lines of code that use our existing GUI skin and a new style we create. Let's get right to it, shall we? Let's start by loading up the front end manager script in MonoDevelop and going to the onGUI method. You'll notice we placed a comment earlier about the menu, down here near the bottom of the onGUI method. That was to remind us where the menu code should go. So, directly under this comment, I'm going to add some code that draws our menu. This will draw a basic frame with a Meltdown Madness title. Next, we'll add buttons for play and quit. Do you see the line here, application.loadlevel reactor room? This is what happens when you press the play button. And in fact, you'll see, you don't actually play the game so much as we load a new level, the reactor room scene specifically. This is very typically how you'll move from level to level throughout your game scripting. If you look at the quit button, you'll notice we have this line, application.quit. This is a line that literally closes up the Unity player, makes your game stop playing. In the editor, you won't notice it do anything, but in the runtime game, your application will quit. Now, all we need to do is save this and create a menu box style in our GUI skin for the appearance of the menu box itself. To do that, we go back to the Reactor Room GUI skin in the Project view and change the size of the custom style array to 8. Then we rename this style menu box. Now, we'll need a background image for the menu. We could use the Reactor Status box that the Reactor Console style uses but it's not really made to scale up very large. I took a version of that file myself and used a photo editor to create a very basic frame we can use. So I'm going to add that frame to our project and then drag that into the background field of the new style's normal section. Finally, I'm going to change the text to bold and italic set its size to 48, and then set the Y value of the content offset to 15. And that's all down here. Change the font size to 48, the font style to bold and italics, and here we're going to expand content offset and set it to 15. There is actually one last thing left to do for our menu to work. We're going to have to add the reactor room scene into our build settings so the Unity knows it's really part of the game. The shortcut keys for build settings in Unity are Control shift to b in case you've forgotten. With the build settings open, just drag the Reactor Room scene into the Scenes and Build list at the top of the panel. Here's a Reactor Room, and you just drag it in like that. And there you go. Now, when you hit play, you'll see your logo page, followed by our menu. Admittedly, not the prettiest menu ever made, but we're really only limited by our artistic skill here now that we know how to build GUIs and menus. Next, we'll cover how to use what you've learned to reuse the work you did here to create a pause menu in-game. Good luck!
At this point, the game is basically done, isn't it? It's time to fix any glaring issues or to polish the experience. In our case, we're going to focus on polish for this segment. Do you remember in an earlier segment when we added the ability to pause the game when the P key was pressed? Well, now that we know how to build interactive UI, we should be able to bring up a pause display when you press P with a button to resume the game when you click on it. Why don't we get started? In this case, we'll start in the reactor room scene, since that's where the pause menu will appear. So let's open the Overseer script so that we can get a look at its code. First, let's add a Boolean variable called pause and set its default value to false. Now we'll head down to the process key input method that we wrote earlier, and we'll find the section where we added game pausing code, and we'll toggle that Boolean from within that code. Next, we'll go to the end of the onGUI method and add some code to draw a pause display with a resume button, like so. So here we are at the end of onGUI, make some space, and then paste in the code. And there you go. All that's left to do is save. Now, when a game round pauses, it will draw a reactor console style box at the center of the screen that says Game Paused, and it will offer a resume game button. Since we're basically done with our game, let's add a stretch goal, one last polish tweak to make it feel right. Right now, if you run out of time in a round, the game just stops. Why don't we write a quick piece of code that will take you to the main menu instead? If you recall, this IE numerator called Round Timer is what controls when the game round ends. Right now, when you run out of time, it just pauses the game, everything just stops. By changing one line of code, we can return the player to the main menu instead. To do that, we simply replace this highlighted line with this new line of code. That's all there is to it. Just save. And in fact, if we come back here to Unity and hit play, we can see we can hit P to pause the game. Press the button to resume the game. Then, if we go to the Overseer, and we change, say, the round length to 5 seconds, we can also test what happens when the timer runs out. As you can see, right back to the main menu. In the next section of the course, We'll look at how to take our effectively finished game a step further by adding a high scores list. Good luck! Welcome to Section 7 of Unity 3D by Example. High scores, saving and loading. In this section, we're going to take a look at tracking player scores in your game so that you can eventually save them in a list, actually building your high scores list, displaying high scores from your main menu, and finally in our pro tips section, building your finished game. Here we go. Welcome back. At this point, however raw, we have a fully functional game. If you were to build it as a standalone PC or Mac title, it would run and play. That said, it really is pretty raw. When a round ends, you're just abruptly taken to the main menu, and even though we do score the player, there's no real bragging rights, no way to show your score to someone else or boast of your accomplishments. Using Unity's GUI and some tricks we've picked up along the way, we should be able to fix both problems with one solution. We'll introduce high score tracking into the game. Eventually, we'll have the option to view high scores from the main menu. Players will get to register a score at the end of every round where they beat an old score. But we need to lay the foundation in code before we can get to that point. Let's start by tracking player score. We already saved the player's audio settings in the preferences class, which means the hard work of saving and loading files is already done. So let's take advantage of that and start by creating a high scores class. We'll create a C sharp script in our project view and we'll name it high scores. Then we're going to open that and as soon as it's open and monitor develop is up, we're going to go back to Unity and we're also going to open the preferences class. Now, we'll copy the save and load methods from the preferences class into the high scores class. Next, we'll convert our high scores class into a regular class instead of a mono behavior. So first we'll delete the reference to a mono behavior. Then we're going to go back to preferences and we're going to grab all of these using references. We're going to copy them up here. Finally, 
we're going to make this serializable so we can save it in a file. Next, we'll add the variables that will be stored in the high scores file, specifically a list of scores and a structure for the scores themselves. So we'll start by adding the structure, which we'll add beneath the class as a whole new entity. And here at the top of the file, we're actually going to add two more using references, one to system.collections and one to system.collections.generic. And then all that's left to do is add a list of score entries called scores. Next, we'll need to change those methods we added so that they load high scores instead of preferences. Essentially, the logic we want to use is identical to what's already here, so we're just changing the variable references. You'll notice I use the refactor feature in MonoDevelop whenever I can. Essentially, when I use rename from the refactor options, it finds every reference in the code and fixes it to match. It's a handy tool as long as you're careful with it and don't get overzealous. Okay, that should do it. Of course, right now there's nothing even referencing the file, let alone saving player scores. Let's fix that by opening the Overseer script and adding high score support. To do that, we'll need to go to the bit of code that controls when a round ends. Thankfully, that's right at the bottom of the class in an I enumerator called Round Timer. Right here. See the round over equal true line directly above application load level main menu? We're going to replace that with a call to a method that lets us submit a score, calculates the player's place on the high scores list, and then returns the completed list back. So this submit score method may seem a little daunting at first. It seems like a lot of code. But in reality, all it's really doing is loading current top 10 list based on your code to retrieve player preferences, and then checking the current score to see where it sits within that list. If there are already 10 spots, it will knock an old score off the list to add it if the score qualifies. Otherwise, if there aren't 10 spots filled already, it'll simply add the new score. When it's done, it'll return the completed top 10 score list to whatever made the call to this method. And that's really all it takes. Using the code you wrote previously to save preferences and some new code we wrote to check high scores at the end of the round, we're now saving the player's high scores. Of course, there are a few issues. The player can't change their initials yet since there's no UI, nor can the player see the list of high scores that are being saved. But we'll address these issues in our next segment as we build on our GUI knowledge to build the high score screen. Good luck! Now that we're saving player scores, we need to implement a way for players to enter their initials and then see the current list of high scores. Let's get started. First, let's go back to the Overseer class. That's where the rounds GUI is drawn, and where we'll add in GUI to display the high scores list. Essentially, we need our GUI to operate in two modes, in round running mode and in round over mode. So, to track that, we'll use the round over variable that we had created previously but never really used. To do that, we'll wrap the existing GUI in an if statement that checks to see if round over is false. Then we'll add an else clause at the end to handle the case of the player's round being over. And I'm going to paste in pre-written code here. Finally, we'll add a method at the end of the overseer class called return scores list we can use to get the currently posted high scores list. Just save your code, and then there you have it. 
Now, when a player ends a round, we will present them with a game over screen and allow them to both look at the current high scores list and submit their score if they desire. You may want to double check the code that's been pasted in for typos or maybe a misplaced brace, anything like that just to make sure it was pasted in correctly. The actual code included with the segment here will, of course, be correct and operational, so feel free to review that. Next, we'll reuse the work we just completed to quickly build a high scores display from the main menu. Good luck! If you look at the game as a whole, really the only thing missing is a way to view the high scores from the main menu. Thankfully, we've already done most of the work, and what remains is very easy to do through Unity. You ready to get started? To implement high scores from the main menu, we're going to use the same trick we used for the end of round display. That means we'll need to start by editing the front end manager class. To add a boolean, we'll call showing scores. We'll use that to track whether we need to show the menu or the high scores list. Then we'll wrap the existing code in the onGUI method with an if statement that checks to see if showing scores is false. Next, we'll add an else clause to the end of the if code that displays the high scores list when showing scores is true. Now, to populate this list, we're going to cheat. We're going to go to the Overseer class, and we're going to copy the code for this that we already wrote there. So this is the on GUI routine for the Overseer. And if you go down to the bottom, we're going to grab everything from here. to here. And then we're going to go back here to paste it in. Next, we'll modify the code we just pasted in by removing the elements related to showing the player's current score, such as the ability to post a high score. Next, we'll change the heading string from Game Over to Meltdown Madness. Don't forget to do the same in the no GUI skin version, uh, which is down here. In truth, if we've done everything right, players will never see the no GUI skin version, but better safe than sorry. Finally, we'll change the behavior of the main menu button by changing the application.load level line to instead set showing scores to false. And again, you'll do this in two different places. One for each version of your GUI. At this point, we have two problems we need to fix. First, we don't have the return score list method in the front end manager that this code uses to get the list of high scores. We can fix that with another copy and paste, so let's do that right now. We'll go over to the Overseer class, and here at the bottom, we'll get return scores list. We'll paste it here, like so. And finally, we'll add using systems.collections.generic to the top of the class, since our high scores list uses the list generic. With that problem solved, all we need to do is provide a way for the player to get to the high scores list. To do that, we'll first copy the quit button, which is this one right here. And we're going to paste in a duplicate, and we're going to shift the copy's coordinates down so that we now have three buttons on our main menu. Then we'll change the original quit button into the high scores button. We'll do that by changing its heading. And let's change its style to reactor status rod failure, so it'll be a yellow button. The last thing we have to do is that we'll change the high scores button results from application.quit to showing scores equals true. Now if you save, there's really only one last thing we need to do. Do you remember back when we first started implementing the high scores list? We changed what happened when the round ended. Well, we still left it loading the main menu here, and so what we need to do is we need to remove this application.load level main menu line and replace it with round over equals true. Now if you save and start the game, from the main menu scene, you should see a high scores button you can press to view the high scores list, and when you play around, you should be presented with the option to leave a new high score, which we can actually show you right here. 
As you can see, there's a yellow high scores button, which if we press, will display our current high scores. In my case, two entries, a simple test entry, and my own personal best. And as you see, if you click Main Menu, you go right back. Next, we'll discuss how to build the game as a standalone application for the PC in our Pro Tips section. Because, my friends, this game is done. Good luck! So how does it feel to have made a game? I mean, from start to finish. You really are done. Well, okay. There is one last step if you ever want anyone else to see the game. You need to make a build. That is, you need to make the game a standalone product you can give to somebody else. Thankfully, Unity makes that really easy to do. Let's jump right into it, alright? All we need to do is open the build settings, which we can do by selecting build settings in the file menu, or by hitting Control shift b Then we'll quickly verify that all of our scenes are included, and if they are, we'll select Standalone PC Mac as our platform. All of our levels are included. PC and Mac is selected. Now I'm working on a PC, so my build target will be Windows. If you're on a Mac, your build target would be set to Mac here in this drop down. Finally, we'll click on Build and Run and select a destination name and folder. And so I already made a folder on my desktop called Meltdown Madness. So I'm going to call the game Meltdown Madness. Then we'll click Save. And we'll start building our game. Now when it's done building, the game will run, but this time it'll be running as a standalone executable from the location you selected. See? Now, if anything seems amiss, say for example you see evidence of a bug, you can go to a folder where you save the build, and in that folder you'll find a subfolder that ends in underscore data. So for example, in my case it would be uh, meltdown madness underscore data. In this folder, you'll find a file uh, called outputlog.txt. This is the equivalent of the debug console when you're running the game from within Unity. If you open it and you read that file, you can usually get an idea of what went wrong. And so there you have it. Now you may have noticed when you ran your build that that initial screen that pops up had no logos, no splash screen, no nothing. You can actually set that yourself in the player settings. So going back to your build settings, if you click on the player settings button, you'll be taken here to the player settings in the inspector. That screen that loads up is the config dialog, and if you look in the splash image section, here under your PC build, you'll find there's a slot for a config dialog banner texture. Just for illustration purposes, I'll throw our Skyward banner in there. You can also set an override so that the PC build has its own icon, again using a texture. Let's see what that does. Well, as you can see, it was kind of a poor choice of texture, but note that this is black now instead of flat and gray, which means that my texture is actually there. There's just not much to see. Congratulations! Your game really is ready to go. That's all there is to it, to making a fully functional game in Unity. Of course, Unity can do a lot more as well, and we'll be looking into some of that in the next section of the course, as we look at ways we can use the game we've already made to quickly produce a game of another similar, but different type. Good luck! Welcome to Section 8, the final section of the course. In this section, we're going to discuss where we go from here. You effectively have a finished game, so in this section of the course, we're going to take a look at extending your work by expanding score into combo scoring. We're also going to look at where we can go from here in the form of finding help in the Unity community. We're also going to look forward and figure out how to port our game to the Android platform for tablets and phones. And finally, we're going to look at actually publishing our game, because that's the point, right? Are you ready? Because here we go. Let's add a combo scoring system to the game. Essentially, we'll be creating a system that looks at when the player last correctly clicked on an unstable reactor, and, if it was within a certain amount of time, gives the player extra points for doing so. We'll also add a system to tell the player when they've earned a combo. Are you ready? Let's get started. First, we'll open the Reactor Core script in Mono Developer. 
and we'll add a boolean called last click good to the class. Uh, and we're going to default that boolean to false. With that in place, we can check each reactor core to see if the player clicked on it correctly or mistakenly. So to do that, we'll add last click good equals true everywhere we've increased times fixed, and we'll add last click good equals false to the preceding if clauses in each case. We'll also add last click good equals false to the default case here. Next, we'll save the Reactor Core class and load the Overseer class so that we can add awareness of combos to the process score routine. To do that, let's add some local variables we can use to calculate bonus multipliers. We're adding two ints, one called bonus multiplier to determine the size of the combo, and one called temp score to figure out how much our current score is increasing by. Next, we'll go down to the calculate score method. In the calculate score method, we have this for each loop here that already checks and increases score. We're going to rewrite it so that it also incorporates bonus multipliers. Finally, We'll add some code beneath the for each loop to take the value of the new temp score variable, multiply it by the bonus multiplier, and then add that to the real score. And of course, save. Okay, now we're tracking score multipliers. The only problem is that we're not showing it to the player. You may have noticed that we referenced a combo boolean that doesn't seem to exist anywhere yet. That's actually the first step to showing the player that they are comboing score. We just need to tell the game what combo is first. So first we're going to add that combo boolean and set its default value to false. We'll do that up here. You may notice that I tend to initialize variables when I define them. Coding standards aside, this is useful in Unity because it provides a default value for you when you see them in the inspector view. All we really have left to do at this point is to add the combo multiplier display box. To do that, we'll basically mirror our existing meltdowns averted score display in the onGUI function. We'll add the following if else clause to accomplish that. So first we're going to go to onGUI. Then we're going to go down to meltdowns averted. Directly beneath that, we're going to add the following. And that should do it. The scoring system is probably a little flaky, since it's done in time slices rather than perfectly determined by actual player input. But it will definitely do the job. Not bad for five minutes' work, right? Next, we're going to discuss where to go for answers to technical issues and advice from fellow developers by taking a look at Unity Answers and the Unity Solutions Wiki. This will prepare us for the big push of publishing our finished game. Good luck! So we could certainly spend our time finding new features to add, new rough spots to polish, and even new bugs to fix. But at this point, the bugs you find are going to be esoteric, way more technical than not. And they're going to lead you down lines of reasoning with questions like, how do I determine what's leaking memory? That's where the advice of fellow Unity developers comes in. I've been making games for nearly 20 years, and there's been one shining truth in that whole time. There's only one kind of developer who won't ask for help, a bad one. In the past, asking for help meant you spent a lot of time up at all hours of the night scouring Google for articles or blogs about your problem. That's still a good tactic, but to save you time, you might want to cut to the chase and come here, the Unity Answers community. Unity Answers is literally a place to come for answers when you have questions about Unity 3D. You should search to see if your question's already been answered, but don't be afraid to jump in and ask the questions you need answered at any time. That's exactly what the site is for. Even better, Often you'll find more than one solution to the problem, which can lead you down new lines of reasoning in your own work. And if the answers you find don't seem to quite cover what you're looking for, you can take some time looking at related questions to see if they bring you a solution. And of course, if you have an answer to a question you see, don't be afraid to provide it. The only way to become part of a community is to get involved. That said, there will be times when your question is a little more vague, 
or when you know you have a problem to tackle, but don't really understand the problem enough to ask a direct question. That's when places like the Unified Community Script Wiki or the Unity Community Forums themselves come in handy. Let's talk about the wiki first. Like any other wiki, it's populated by community contributions and edits, but here everything is focused on Unity and making games. My favorite section as a developer is this one, the script section. The script section is divided into categories, and each contains community contributed scripts that add all sorts of functionality when used. Every contributor has different styles as well, and that includes the way they code. This mix of approaches to problem solving and the various dialects of scripting that you'll run into can be a bit of a challenge, but it's incredibly eye opening and it makes for much faster learning if you can keep track of it all. Finally, let's not forget the Unity community forums themselves. As you can see, there are conversations about any number of topics ranging from general programming tips all the way to very specific implementations of algorithms and other technical topics, and that's just here in the scripting section. Any one of these resources can help you with a question, or even with a general, what should happen next feeling that you might have. You may even opt for more in-depth C-sharp coding instruction to attempt to supplement the skills you've already learned. Of course, where you go next is all up to you now. But for us, Next, we're going to be activating our 30-day trial of Unity Pro and its Android license as we prepare to port our game to the Android operating system. Good luck! For this section of the course, you will either need Unity 3D Pro with an Android license, or you will need to activate your 30-day free trial of Unity 3D with its free Android license trial as well. You can do that here in the Help menu by selecting Enter Serial Number and then selecting Start Trial from the web page that loads. I actually own a Unity 3D Pro license, so I can't really show you that, but it's a very straightforward process. Just enter your email and press the button on the web page. Once you have Unity loaded, you might notice a difference immediately. It'll usually load the dark skin by default. That's a sign that you're in Pro because it's not available in the regular version. I'm kind of a fan of the dark skin. You can swap between it and the classic Unity light look by going to the edit menu if you're not, though. In fact, you can do that by going to edit and then selecting preferences, and that'll bring up the preferences window. Next, in the general section, find the skin dropdown and uh, change it to your preferred choice. I'm going to switch it to dark because that's the one I happen to like. Unity Pro actually offers several advantages over the free version of Unity, but perhaps the most useful is the profiler. Profiler allows you to see how quickly your game is running, what it's spending its time on, and how it's using its memory. For example, since we made Meltdown Madness in a hurry, I would not be surprised to learn it had a memory leak, a place where we're allocating memory but never giving it back up when we're done. One way to know for sure is to see how the memory is spent in the Profiler. So first we're going to go to the Window menu and select Profiler, which you can also do by pressing Control 7. Next, we're going to run the game and play around, and then we're going to quit. I've set my round time in the Overseer to 10 seconds for this test to save time. As you can see, the profile fills up with information, and we can see in our case that we've gained a few megs of memory usage which is a pretty good indication of a leak of some sort. But since we're running from within the editor, some small amount of leakage is likely to occur anyway. Still, it wouldn't hurt to track down in your spare time. I can actually think of one place where we could be leaking memory already. That's the Overseer. Let's load it up in MonoDevelop. The Overseer could be leaking memory because we don't destroy the variables like our list of reactors when the Overseer is destroyed. We can fix that with another built-in method in a mono behavior, the onDestroy method. Here we'll use on destroy to go through the list of reactors and destroy them one by one. And I'm just going to paste this code in. Now, if we run the game, we should see that the bulk of the memory we had allocated is now released. Yep, and we're basically right back where we started. 
And that's actually just one of the features we gain with Unity Pro. There are many more. That one feature alone, though, is enough to give you the information to make a slow game run quickly or fit a game into the memory space of a mobile device that was once too large, which actually brings us to the topic of our next segment. In our next video segment, we'll try our hand at porting the game to the Android operating system. Good luck! As we discussed a little in the last segment, one of the things Unity Pro's trial gives you is a 30-day trial of the Android at license. That means with a little work, we can actually port Meltdown Madness to run on an Android tablet such as a Galaxy Tab. The Galaxy Tab is an Android 2.3 tablet that I use in my own work as my baseline spec. It's basically the bottom of the line here in America at this point in the tech curve. Before we get started, you're going to need to install the Java JDK from Oracle at http www.oracle.com slash tech network slash java slash java se slash downloads slash index.html it's this address right here that can take a little time so we're going to skip showing it but once you're done you also need to go to developer.android.com and download and install the android sdk you can do that here at http colon slash slash developer.android.com slash sdk slash index.html it takes quite a while to install and then download the complete Android SDK, so we use the magic of editing to skip ahead and assume that you have installed them both. Once you do have both of these software development kits installed, you'll need to go to the Unity Preferences and point Unity to the new SDK location. First, go to the Edit menu and select Preferences. Next, select External Tools from the column on the left. This will reveal the External Tools options. The only one we actually want here, though, is the Android SDK location. Now, click on the Android SDK location field and select the appropriate folder for your SDK. You may notice that you start without the appropriate folder here. That's because it'll sometimes start you one level too deep with the wrong file name. And so just go up one level, then select the Android SDK folder, and hit Select Folder. Now we're ready to start porting. First things first though, let's officially change this over to an Android platform. We start by opening the build settings, which is Control shift b and then we click on Android in the list of platforms, and then we click Switch Platforms. At this point, Unity will begin the work of converting any necessary assets to Android-friendly formats, and when it's done, we can set up our Android environment. Next, we'll click on Player Settings and bring up the settings in our Inspector view. And we want to look at Resolution and Presentation. This is where we can set Screen Orientation and our Loading Indicator. Since we set the game to run in 1024 by 768 on the desktop, we'll want to use a Landscape Orientation. And to make it clear when we're loading levels or not, let's set the Loading Indicator to Large. Finally, We'll go to the Other Settings section so that we can set up the environment configuration. Basically, we want to set it up so that we have supported the lowest end 3D implementation we can. We'll start by changing the device filter to ARM v6 with VFP. Then we want to set the graphics level to OpenGL ES 1.x. Finally, we'll set write access to external so that players can install and run the game from an SD card. Now our environment is fully configured. Before we jump into code though, we should probably adjust our lighting, which is in the reactor room. In my own work, I've noticed that my PC is capable of significantly more subtle lighting than the Android devices we test on. So to compensate for that, we're going to have to increase the intensity of the five lights in the scene so that we're not just looking at a dark room when we play. I tend to use an intensity of 2.0, you could get away with less if you like darker scenes, though, so definitely experiment here. Also, don't forget to get the four spotlights that are in the reactor cores themselves. Thankfully, with the latest version of Unity, you can actually highlight them all. Adjust the intensity. Now, with that done, our next step is to convert the code. So let's open the Overseer and Reactor Core classes. Believe it or not, there really isn't all that much to do to convert the game to run on Android. 
Sure, to be thorough you might want to rescale the GUI, but it's actually already close enough to be functional. The only thing really holding the game back from working on Android is the fact that we're looking for keyboard and mouse input instead of touch input. So to address that, we're going to add some code to the update routine, and we're going to encase it in an if clause that we write that will detect touches like so. And again, I'm just going to paste the code in. Admittedly, this code is called every update loop, and maybe that's not the most performance friendly place for it. I'll leave it up to you to optimize your game. But now, if you bring up the build settings with Control Shift B again, and you select Build and Run, you'll be able to build an Android package for your game. We're going to call it Meltdown Madness Test. .apk. And if you have an Android compatible device connected to your computer via a USB cable, Unity will automatically copy that package to that device, install it, and run it for you so you can test it immediately. There is one caveat, of course. There it is right there, in fact. You have to properly identify your bundle. And you'll notice in this case it says com.yourcompanyname.yourproductname. Well, you can't ship that. And so we're going to put in a name here. Mine Indie Studio is called Skyward Corp. And so we're going to call this one com.skywardcorp.meltdownmadness. And there you go. In the next section, We'll cover how to take an Android package and publish it on the Google Play Market. Good luck! Well, at this point, barring perhaps some optimization or bug fixing, our game is done. We've added our last feature, and we've even ported the game over to Android. So what's left? Well, if you believe your game is done and ready to go, the only thing left to do is the one thing we developers hold most dear. It's time to ship it. In our case, we're going to publish the game on Google Play, but doing so requires that we've done a few things ahead of time, namely that we've created an Android developer account and that we've connected it to a Google Merchant account. That process can take several days, but it begins here. This is developer.android.com slash distribute slash Google Play slash publish slash register dot html. That's a mouthful, but the instructions there are great and necessary if you want to publish your game and make a little money in the process. Once your developer and merchant accounts are set up, you can log into the development console, which will look something like this. As you can see, I've got an example project of my own already here in my own account. To begin publishing your own game, you'll just click Upload Application right here at the bottom right. However, before you can upload an application, you need to sign an application. That is, you're going to need to create a digital encryption key you can use to encrypt your apps in a way that proves they came from you to add your signature to the game in a very real way. Thankfully, Unity and the Android SDK you installed earlier came with the tools you'll need to do this, and of course, Unity makes it relatively easy. We will need one piece of information from your Google Play developer account before we can jump into Unity and sign our app, and that's your public key. To get that information, you want to click on Edit Profile here in the upper left. From this page, what you need is the public key from the licensing and in-app billing section of your profile. Just highlight that and copy it so that it's ready to be pasted into Unity in a moment. Okay, so now let's jump into Unity so we can sign our application. The key creation and signing information are located in the player settings, which you can bring up via the build settings by pressing Control shift b which will bring up the build settings window, and then clicking on the player settings button. This will bring them up in the inspector. Next, we'll click on the publishing settings here in the Android section. Then, we'll paste in our public key here in the public key field at the bottom of the page. Now, we don't have an existing key store to use to sign our game, so we're going to put a check in Create New Key Store. And then we're going to click on Browse Key Store to tell Unity where we'd like to put the new key store and what we'd like to name it. We're going to call this one Meltdown Madness Test dot key store. Now, a key store holds passwords, but it's also password protected itself. So make sure that you put in a password you remember, and then confirm it there in the confirmation. Now, of course, even though we've created a key store, it doesn't actually have any encryption keys in it yet. So to create one, we need to select Create New Key from this drop down here. Now, the first four fields matter the most. 
but make sure that you fill out all of these fields for best security practices. The validity field here is one of the most important fields. Google Play requires that you have a validity key of at least 50 years, so it's best to just leave it be. And some of the fields you can leave blank, but you really should fill out as much as you can. Okay, now that we've created our key, we just need to select it here and enter its password. Now all that remains to sign the build is to actually make a new APK, which we can do by pressing the Build button in the Build Settings page. Remember, you can bring the Build Settings page back up by pressing Control shift b if it's not visible. When you click Build, Select a destination for your APK that you'll remember, such as your Downloads or Documents folder, or your desktop. I'm going to put mine on the desktop. Then hit Save. Now the build process will begin. Once the build is done and the APK is signed, we can return to the Google Play website and finish the work of publishing. And we can begin that process by calling up the Developer Console in the web browser again. Finally, we actually get to press the Upload Application button. Once we're here, we click Choose File. We're going to point it at our APK. In my case, mine is on the desktop. And then once it's selected, we hit Upload and send it on its way. Now, when the upload finishes, we should see the upload panel update itself with information about the build. All we need to do here is hit Save. And we're brought to the Edit Application page. To publish your application, all you need to do now is provide the necessary artwork and screenshots in the Upload Assets section here, and thankfully they tell you everything you need to know about what sort of screenshots you need to produce, and they mark the things that you don't need to do as optional. Then once you've done that, you'll need to describe your game in the Listing Details section, and then finally you'll want to set your price, maturity rating, which countries it's available for, etc. here in Publishing Options. And then, if you haven't yet, fill out your contact information, provide a support email that your users can send their problems or questions to, and accept here. Assuming that you had everything set up, that's really all there is to it. All you need to do now is hit Publish, and within the next few hours, up to maybe a day, your application would be available in the market. Now, of course, for this application, we don't actually have any of this material, and so we can't really upload this application yet. But let me show you the application I have here. This is actually a game I'm about to release in my indie studio, and as you can see, the information necessary is really not that hard to produce. In fact, I did all of this with GIMP and other free photo editing software. For us, that's really all there is to it. Through this course, we've taken a blank Unity project, built a working PC game, ported it to the Android platform, and then began the process of setting it up for publication on the Google Play Market. You are armed with the basic knowledge of what it takes to make a Unity game, so what happens next is up to you. Good luck.